हरे 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 राम Shiko Shishiko in the Thai Mai Po Shashi Ki Jai. Shishi Tosinath Ki Jai. Shikurna Bhavan Ki Jai. Oh, glorious to your Sambha devotees. Grantaraj Sriman Bhagavatam Ki Jai. Hare Krishna. Namo Vishnu Vidaya Krishna Pastaya Bhutale Shri Mate Bhakti Vedanta Shwamini Tinamani. Namaste Sarasate Devi. Gauravani Pracharine Nevasesha Sanyavadi Pasta Chari Shitani Om Jnana Timaran Dasya Gyananjana Shalakaya Jakshuran Vilitamina Tasmai Shri Gaurave Shri Chaitanya Mano Vistam Sapitam Ye Nubhutane Shvayam Rupa Patantikam Mukam Koti Vachalam Kangam Langayate Gadim Yatkriham Tamaham Bande Shri Guru Dinatarna Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya Om Namo Bhagavate Hare Krishna. What is your good name, Prabhu? Jose. Pardon? Jose. Koshik? Jose. Jose. Jose? No. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Krishna.
Well, let's see. Is there anything on the board? Anything on the board? I don't know which one of these two it will be. Probably this one. What's on the screen? Oh, okay. Hare Krishna. So this evening we're going to... This is, there's nothing a little higher that I can put this on, is there? Or are they going to kind of have to hold it like this? Looks pretty good. Oh, uh, it, it might work. At least it's flat. Bring it closer. Yeah, that's great. Thank you. So, welcome everyone this evening. I'm here near and far. And this evening we're going to, as we were trying to absorb this morning the importance of I'm on the back of the chair that'd be cool. Thank you. Thank you, Prabhupada. The importance of hearing Srimad Bhagavatam as the medicinal cure for the ills, not just of Kali Yuga but of all material conditions which were materially inflicted in this material world, everyone's in illusion of some kind or another. But the hearing of Srimad Bhagavatam is particularly a special, most whole of Vedic literatures of course are directed towards this, but particularly the Srimad Bhagavatam is directed towards clearing up all misgivings helping us to ascertain the difference between illusion and reality, rise above the modes of nature, by hearing from Sri from hearing from all the pure devotees of the Lord, the message of Godhead. So, I don't know, just spontaneously, just before coming, or we went somewhere and we came here, just to, we would just put on Little, the little time we have. What, how long do we have? An hour? Well, as long as I like. Uh, we're not the controllers. Yeah, no, an hour till okay. hour is good. So more or less an hour. So I think we can try to hear some Srimad Bhagavatam in the next hour. Teachings of the Lord. Many of you have read this chapter of the Bhagavatam. Canto 3. How many of you have read this? The majority of those present have read. And if you have the Srimad Bhagavatam or you're reading online or whatever, the third canto, the, of course, the, the, la, the first part is quite technical. You're not all, but pretty technical. The last part is very philosophical. Discussion of Lord Chaitanya, of Lord Kapila Dev, rather. Um, Lord Kapila Dev, Sometimes when you mention the word Kapila, uh, people have, not devotees, but people in India may have a different impression of Lord Kapila Devi. He's teaching some kind of atheistic philosophy. There's another Kapila, um, famous in history. I don't know much about him, but he taught atheism. But we're talking of a different Kapila here, an empowered incarnation of Godhead, who appeared specifically to um, explain the path to the Absolute, the, pa the path, Tamasimam Jyoti Yukamaha, the path out of darkness into the light. So his teachings are very important, part of the Srimad Bhagavatam, um, third canto chapter, this is chapter 25, which we're going to be starting here this evening, and we're going to read a little bit and discuss if we, if, if possible. So that's Lord Kapila Dave there. And his mother is sitting there on the other 
cushion or the other asana. Her name was Mother Devahuti. So those who are, are not familiar, um, Devahuti and her husband, her husband's name was Kardama, Kardama Muni. And uh, he was a great yogi, mystic yogi. And she was the daughter of great king, royalty. And they were betrothed, they were married. And because he was a great yogi, he wasn't very interested in material life. But being a woman, and she wanted to have family, so he fulfilled her desires in various ways. And uh, they had how many daughters? Eight, was it eight daughters? I can't remember. He had uh, quite a few daughters, but no sons, so she was eager to have a son. This is maybe not so much a, a, an issue these days, but in tradition, and even in the West, having a son was important because he carried on the family, you know, whatever, legacy or whatever. So she wanted a son, eventually her husband gave her, fulfilled her desire, but upon the birth of the son, shortly after that, her husband left and renounced the world again. So she was more or less brought up with her son. Now the point has come now, um, it's amazing how Cardamom really left home because her son was a, basically an expansion of Godhead. And Carter and me left home. Can you imagine? <laughs> Quite extraordinary. You could say he's teaching a lesson, the, um, in, at least in traditional times, ancient times, whatever you call it. It was the standard Panchavodam Vanam Vrijat. At the age of 50, one is supposed to retire to the forest or mountains and just dedicate oneself to spiritual pursuits, detach oneself from the family. We can still be there to some extent, but this age of Kali is not quite the same. Many times people get married in their 50s and it's not the same. We're not living in a society where this on ashram is in place. So anyway, he left home, so she's alone with her son and uh, she's very concerned, in a sense, for her own situation. So, aside from that, we just take up the essence of the teaching. So we're going to read some verses. This is in the 25th chapter, if you want to follow. Now, this is not the, the purports I've more or less left out most of them, just a few points mentioned only. Text number 7 onwards. Devahuti said, I am very sick of the disturbance caused by my material senses. For because of this disturbance, my Lord, I have fallen into the abyss of ignorance. A little comment from Srila Prabhupada there. Unless one becomes tired of material sense gratification, there is no opportunity to hear transcendental messages from a person like Kapila. Wow, Harry Ball, Ram. <laughs> Harry Ball. Jai, nice to see you. Hare Krishna. I think that you, you don't hear. I think the last time I saw you had a bit more hair. Yeah. <laughs> Hare Krishna. You're either a hairy Krishna or a hairy. Either way, you're a hairy Krishna. Relax. Take your seat. Tired of material sense gratification. It seems a little contradictory. There's no opportunity to hear transcendental messages from a person like Kapila. At the same time, it's the, this is supposed to be the medicine to cure us of all ills. 
many people may be exposed to the Krishna conscious movement, but they don't necessarily hear in the real sense of the term. They're not. We also hear many messages, but we don't necessarily really hear them. We, every morning, those who are in the temple, maybe at home, you also chant the ten offenses against the holy name. Sometimes we have, I hear, after hearing so many instructions on this matter. And still, we remain attached to sense gratification. We hear the subject matter, we hear the messages, but we're not really hearing in one sense. It's hearing means it's like eating. It's nice to eat, we taste nice prasadam, but digestion has to be digested. The food is not digested, it's not much value. Nice taste, but sometimes it exhausts us if we're not digesting it, rather than energized. It has to be digested, so the subject matter has to be digested. The real hearing is the digestion of the subject. And as long as we're not tired of material sense gratification, it's not really transcendental. At best it's mixed with the modes of nature, mixed form of devotion. But when we hear from a person like Kapila, Lord Kapila Dev, and Srila Prabhupada in their presence especially, of course, there is much more chance, at least, of that transformation taking place. So the essential aspect which we're hearing, to, going to hear tonight is one of transformation. Mother Kapila, uh, excuse me, Mother Devahuti, is posing herself, in that sense, into a position, just like Arjuna posed himself, put himself in that position of a disciple, and for the sake of us, Prabhupada would usually emphasize the example of a mother when her son marries and the wife comes into their home. The mother doesn't directly instruct the daughter-in-law. She instructs the daughter through, the daughter-in-law rather, through the daughter. As the daughter is used to that, she's expecting to be instructed by her mother. The daughter-in-law may not. So in this way, Arjuna takes the role of, an, of a person in the modes of nature so that the um, message can be um, available to us. And we hear it in that way. But it's, we're meant to apply it also. Not meant to just hear it, so to speak. It's for application. So these teachings of Lord Kapila Day are very essential in our spiritual lives, in this little section especially. The next verse, Your Lordship is my only means of getting out of this darkest region of ignorance, because you are my transcendental I, which by your mercy only I have attained after many, many births. We sometimes get this in a neophyte stage of our lives, this, you know, like a child or so, thinks that they're, whatever they're into is, is it, and is the absolute right, or whatever it may be. We hear this sometimes in religion, it's the only way, and, you know, whatever, we don't want to mention names. But in one sense it's true, and in one sense it's not fully understood. Yes, there is a way, of enlightenment, there is a way of liberation, there is a way of God-realization, and that way is, in one sense, is one, but it appears in many forms. And it may be presented in many ways, in different time, place, and circumstance. But the way, ultimately, is pure devotional service. <laughs> pure devotee of the Lord is doing nothing but presenting the means and the methodology to come to pure devotional service. 
is the way, it's the only way. It's the only way to perfection. It's not like there are many paths to perfection. They may appear many, but actually they're, they're really not. It's the same substance inside, just presented in different packets and so on, according to the receiver, or maybe sometimes mixed with other ingredients in order to be digestible. But it's the same basic medicinal process, pure devotional service, all, essentially speaking, all bona fide religious practices. At the root of it is to come to the platform of loving God. And love of God means devotional service. It's not just a sentiment. It's a living reality. It's our actual constitution. So, transcendental I, you are the only means, especially in the case when, of course, she's in front of Kapila Dave, where whatever we are, we've come under the shelter of Sri Prabhupada and our acharyas. They are our I, Om Jnana Timurandas. We just recited that prayer. They've opened their eyes with the torchlight of knowledge, the eyes which were blinded by the darkness of ignorance, of seeing things, seeing things separately from Krishna. That's called Maya, illusion. When we see things in relationship with ourselves, specifically, which is the normal perception of persons in this world, this is Maya, this is the illusion. Krishna consciousness means to see things in relationship with Krishna, how Krishna's hand is working in every situation. What we may describe as favorable or unfavorable, one who has spiritual vision sees it as being, let's say, nothing but the movement of the Lord's energies in various ways. One doesn't become elated or dejected over the movements of this material energy or others who are under the influence of the material energy. Rather, one is undisturbed by those workings. That's basically the first lesson of the Bhagavad Gita, to become undisturbed in the face of duality. By seeing, and even if one sees things from the perspective that we're not the body, in other words, we're transcendental or aloof from the mind, and the world around us and so on. One may not be so disturbed, but a devotee is way beyond that. It's just like we were hearing this morning, Pallad Maharaj was so affixed in his meditation on Krishna or Lord Nishingadev, pretty much oblivious or not even concerned with what's going on around him in terms of the torture which was being imposed upon him. The same with Haridas Thakur. Great devotees are so absorbed like that. They're becoming absorbed in the spiritual subject matter, so we're not so disturbed by the. This is our constitution. We see this in the material world also to some extent. When a person is rightly situated in a material position according to their mundane, their mundane dharma, if you want to call it that, their mundane nature, you're quite contented materially, at least for some time, and not so disturbed with causes of disturbance around one. Being rightly situated was a very, uh, you could say, very emphasized factor in Vedic times, ancient times, to find a correct situation in life, both in one's varna and one is ashram, so that one could be as peaceful as you can expect in this material world, and giving one an opportunity then to be a little bit more focused on spiritual subject matters. But if we're always disturbed about what we're doing or about what others are doing, etc., it's very difficult to focus on the Holy Name or to focus on the Srimad Bhagavatam. So a lot of emphasis was placed upon that, of uh, minimizing the stress and anxiety and whatever it may be due to our contact with um, being wrongly situated, let's say, in our Varna and Ashram. And so, the only means of getting out of this darkest region of ignorance, 
So to get this opportunity, Pramanda Brahmati Kaum Bhagavan Jeev Guru Krishna Basati Pai Bhakti Atta Beach. It's extremely rare to get this opportunity to meet a pure devotee of the Lord. Very rare. Um, after wandering, Lord Chaitanya Mahaprabhu speaks this. After wandering in this material world through countless lifetimes, by the mercy of Krishna, one may get this opportunity to meet with a pure devotee of the Lord. By his mercy, one receives the Bhakti Lata Beach. Potentially, love of God is already there in our heart. It's not something which is um, inherited from somebody else, so to speak. It's awoken by somebody else. It's ignited. By the presence of fire, wood burns. Potentiality for fire is already there in the wood, although it's not manifested. Potentiality for love of God is the constitution of every living entity. But it's awoken by the association of pure devotional service. So the, it's already there, it's, in, it's inherent, not inherited, it's inherent. But it's not awoken, it's not awoken without the association of somebody who is manifesting or is absorbed in that inherent nature. That's the principle of devotional, of preaching, to awaken that inherent tendency to love Krishna or see things for Krishna's pleasure. See things in relation with Krishna is not some kind of dream state or artificial imposition. It develops by, by hearing from such a person and practically applying their teachings, although we may not have realized the, the subject matter, but we have some faith and some fortune. And we apply their teachings in practical ways as well, not just in terms of con philosophical conviction or sentiment, but in practical terms. Because all this energy that we are presently aware of, the material energy, is Krishna's energy. They teach us how to engage everything in the, for the pleasure of Krishna. Daily worship is an important activity of cooking that which Krishna likes, dressing Krishna for his pleasure, um, and doing everything, keeping everything just for Krishna, make, trying to make all arrangements for Krishna's pleasure, thinking of how to please him, nice incense, nice flowers, and so on and so forth. The divorce who are worshipping the deities, are always thinking like this. How to do that which will bring more pleasure to Krishna. We're not doing it for our own sense gratification, at least we shouldn't be. It's for Krishna's pleasure, satisfying Krishna's senses, and seeing how everything can be engaged. This is beginning, this is the practical beginning of, of seeing things in relation with Krishna, coming out of the darkness into the light. Um, so that way the pure devotees, they are the ones who are giving us this, no one else can give it. It's a great opportunity. Bhakti Latam Beach. And that seed of bhakti, the devotional seed, is awoken, is, is basically dead, in sense, or at least perverted at best. So in the association of pure devotees of the Lord, it becomes awoken and manifests in their association. Just as when the sun rises in the morning, the darkness of night is dissipated. Um, Prabhupada writes in a purport, there's a word in the, in the verse, par parum, refers to one who can take the disciple to the other side. This side is conditional life. The other side is a life of freedom. Unconditional, hoitikiya patiyata. It's not conditioned. In the beginning, our devotional service also may be conditioned. In other words, it's mixed. I want what I want, the way I see it, and so on. And gradually, by following or executing the guidelines given by the pure devotees of the Lord, one can gradually come to unconditional service, unmotivated, unconditional, uninterrupted devotional service. That's the life of freedom when we're no longer controlled. We think we're free, but actually the freedom of this material world is bondage. We're just surrendering to our minds. 
surrendering to our minds, whatever minds demands are there, or trying to adjust it to fulfill the false ego's intentions or ideas of who we are, etc. We're surrendered to this illusion. It's just like a reflection of reality, but we're surrendered to that. It's a dream-like state. And we're busy trying to adjust the dream so we can have a nice dream. But usually they're nightmares. The spiritual master takes the disciple to the other side by opening his eyes with knowledge. We are simply, we are suffering simply because of ignorance, quite simple. Simply because of ignorance, different types of ignorance are there, various kinds of ignorance of our identity, of the nature of God, of the past leading to realization, of what the causes of the universe are, or our happinesses and distresses, what happens to us when we leave this body. You can go on and on and on. There's no end. The variations of ignorance. And it's not all about trying to make the ignorant situation a nicer one. It's like Trabunga Nandapur was saying this morning. He was, uh, I don't know, prisons or some place or another. And they said, he asked the prisoners, some prisoners, it must be pretty tough. And he said, no, oh, you get used to it. It becomes normal after a while. You get used to it. <laughs> Material world is like that. We get used to it. We accept it as normal. And ups and downs within that normality. But it's not reality. It's a false situation. Next verse. Now be pleased, my Lord, to dispel my great delusion. Due to my feeling of false ego, I have been engaged by your maya and I've identified myself with the body and consequent bodily relations. <laughs> we discussed a little that this morning, this bodily identification. Me and mine, this is the, in a nutshell, is the basic and, um, nature of one in maya. This is me, this is mine. Uh, this is an illusion. People are under that illusion. And this is due to our false ego of identifying himself separately from Krishna. Whatever form it may be, animal, bird, beast, human, everyone is under this illusion. Prabhupada says, indirectly it is the Lord who gives the facility to forget him. We can't even forget Krishna without his will because we want to forget him. Krishna is reciprocating with us and places under us under the influence of Maya and we forget him. And then Maya then of course helps us to identify with the material energy in this body as the self and everything around us is for my pleasure. This is the illusory energy's business. And uh, because we want it. It's not that you know we're, someone's to blame for this, it's our choice. Due to my feeling of false ego, my women that. Devahuti therefore said, my engagement in sense gratification was also due to you. This is a common argument. God is the cause of everything. He's the cause of my sufferings. He's the cause of the wars. He's the cause of the suffering of this world, everything. It's his fault. Why did he do this? We sometimes think like that. But, uh, you don't, if you have children, you know that sometimes Despite your good advice, the child does otherwise. And sometimes you have to let the child learn from experience, within reason. No, so it's our will. We want to be, we want to see things separately from Krishna, but we can't unless Krishna allows us. So he arranges this material world where we forget him entirely, more or less. But he's also there. He's also always available if we feel otherwise may take some time, but when we come to our senses, his pure devotees or he, scriptures, etc., are there to help us. When one sincerely surrenders, where do we get there? No. Uh, now kindly get me free from this entanglement, Devahuti wants to be free. We have to desire. But most people want to desire to get free, but they don't really want to, let's say, give up material sense gratification. 
Kabehamahe Rabo Sri Vrindavan. If you want to go to the spiritual world, then Vishaya Chirya Kabehe. You have to be willing to give, give up these forms of sense gratification. By the grace of the Lord, one is allowed to enjoy this material world. But when one is disgusted with material enjoyment and is frustrated, and when one sincerely surrenders unto the lotus feet of the Lord, then the Lord is so kind that he, free, he frees one. We can't free ourselves. He frees us. Less in time. We're actually had enough. We're fed up with this material. Well, each of these points can be an extended discussion that we're going to jump on. Devahuti continued, I have taken shelter of your lotus feet because you are the only person of whom to take shelter. You are the axe which can cut the tree of material existence. I therefore offer my obeisances unto you, who are the greatest of all transcendentalists, and I inquire from you as to the relationship between man and woman, and between spirit and matter. Very intelligent lady. Um, who sincerely wants to change, sincerely is exposing herself. You are the axe to cut this material attachment. Prabhupada had longer purport. The purport's are longer, I've just taken a few lines out. Of it. The tree of material existence is explained in the 15th chapter of the Bhagavad Gita. If you want to read that, 15th chapter of the Bhagavad Gita. The tree of material existence like a banyan tree, a shutter tree, whose root is upward and whose branches are downwards. It is recommended there that one has to cut the root of the material existential tree with the axe of detachment. Big topic. It's not enough. You can, if you've been, ever been in a, a field or a farm or one of you, you have to sometimes Take the weeds, you have to get rid of the weeds, but if you just cut them at the surface, they grow again. One has to get the root out. One has to remove the root from the ground, otherwise they will grow again. So like that, we have to cut the right of the root. We see in the teachings of Rupa Goswami in the Nectar of Instruction, I don't know the Sanskrit verse, but he describes how, you know, those who are, what is that verse? Those who are doing this, you know, the, the, the taste of sugar candy is very unpleasant. For sugar candy is a cure for jaundice. Similarly, the, the sound of the holy name or chanting the holy name is the medicine to cure us of this diseased condition of life, this illusion. But unfortunately, those who are too attached to sense gratification as we heard this morning, Matirna Krishna Paratakswatova, Mitobi Patiata Grihamitanam. That is difficult for them. Their two mind is too much attached in this world. And to cut that knot. The process of cutting a knot is this very one. Yodani Jasana Yukta Karma Grantana Bandanam. Chindanti Kovidas Tasya Kona Kur Katarta. That Chindanti, that's the sword to cut with a sword of knowledge. Uh, this is the purpose of life. That the uh, attachments or the illusions, the fruit of bondage in this world can be cut by remembering the personality of Godhead. Therefore, who will not pay attention to hearing his message? Uh, every learned man knows this. We have to cut that knot, that's karma grunt and abundantum, which is binding us in this world. The process is to hear the subject matter as Devahuti is doing from the right source. So as long as we're still thinking, I can get some mundane pleasure out of this material, in this material, or even in the so-called devotional service. It's, we're still holding on to the, uh, our anchors are still in the ground. The root is still in the ground. That's to be uprooted, uprooted. And right down to the root. And how is that done? Kindvada By very carefully, very carefully hearing 
the holy name. Taking shelter of the holy name. Anudana means always, but at least regularly. Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna. 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 Hare Hare. Hare Rama. Hare Rama. Rama Rama. Hare Hare. Taking shelter. The living entities since time immemorial. No. Where are we? What is the attachment? The attachment involves Prakriti and Purusha. This is interesting. The living entities are trying to lord it over material nature. Since the conditioned soul takes material nature to be the object of his enjoyment, and he takes the position of the enjoyer, he is therefore called Purusha. The living entities in the, in the guises of men and women are trying to enjoy the material energy. Therefore, in one sense, everyone is Purusha, because Purusha means enjoyer, and Prakriti means enjoyed. So in this material world, both men and women, not man or woman, of course, maybe in this lifetime we call ourselves a man, next lifetime we may be a woman, and vice versa. We're neither one or the other. Uh, but one who does think that they're a man or woman is trying to be the Purusha. But that's not our position, it's our position is Prakriti. Maybe para Prakriti, but nonetheless Prakriti. We are energy, energy, to be enjoyed by the Purush. But everyone is trying to be the enjoyer, the controller, the center. In this material, both the so-called man and so-called women are imitating the real Purush. So now we're moving on. She's submitted herself like this. And she's humbly and submissively, as we hear from Bhagavad Gita, submitting herself, that her doubts, her illusions, her fears, her anxieties, her whatever, her ignorance, everything is slashed with a weapon of knowledge. Armed with yoga, stand and fight. So as was mentioned earlier, that change is a vote by the good fortune of meeting or coming in contact with a pure devotee, a representative of Krishna, who carries the Lord in his heart. By that association we can wake up. And this is a key verse in the, this chapter. We've jumped forward a few verses. Though Kapila Dev describes a little philosophically the nature of the difference between Purush and Prakriti, man and woman, and so on. And what is our consciousness and so on. So then he comes to this verse here. We can chant together. Prasangam ajarang pasham atmana kavayo vedoho saiva sarushu krito moksha dwaram apavitam And it's nice to know the word for word. It helps us to remember the verse, the meaning. Prasangam means attachment. Ajaram is very strong attachment. Pasham, entanglement. So entangled with a very strong attachment. Atmana, the soul. Kavayaha, learned men, kavis. Viduhu, no. Saeva, that same. Sadushu, to the devotees, the sadhus. Kritaha, applied. Mokshadwaram, the door of liberation. Apavritam, opened. Translation, every learned man knows very well that attachment for the material is the greatest entanglement of a spirit soul. But that same attachment, nothing wrong with being attached is what we're attached to. That same attachment when applied to the self-realized devotees opens the door of liberation. One of the famous verses of this chapter. We're not going to read the purport, we'll go on to the next verse. Titikshava karunika surida sarvadehinam ajata shatra bhakshanta sadavasadu bhushanaha Another very famous verse. Titikshava, tolerant. Karunika, merciful. Suridaha, friendly. 
Sarva Dehi Nam to all living entities. Ajata Shatravaha, inimical to none. Shantaha, peaceful. Sadavaha, abiding by scriptures. Sarubhushanaha, adorned with sublime characteristics. You know, the first question one may ask is, where do I find and how do I recognize such a devotee of the Lord in whose association uh, my tran transformation may take place? So here's some of the characteristics of such a personality to whom we must approach or associate with. He's tolerant. The symptoms of a sadhu is that he is tolerant, merciful and friendly to all living entities. He has no enemies. He's peaceful. He abides by the scriptures and all of his characteristics are sublime. Pretty uh, amazing, you could say characteristics or qualities of such a sadhu, a pure devotee of the Lord, in whose association transformation can take place. And how does it work? Well, we see this is also there in the teachings of Narada Muni, um, how his association with the Bhaktivedantas was transformed in their association. And they blessed him. He was able to hear the sound vibration of the holy name. Um, he desired to hear from them. He was detached and so on. You see the same thing in the first, in the second chapter of the first canto, um, where Sutta Goswami explains divin, divine and divinity, divine and divine nature, whatever it is. And uh, there we see the same principle, Shushu Shoshadansyavasadeva Gitaruchi. By serving those great devotees, we're free from all vice. Great service is done by such service. One gains an affinity for hearing the messages of Asudev, Krishna, Srinvatamas, Vakata, Krishna, Ponya Shravana, Kirtana, Vidantak, Stoya, Vadrani, Vidanoti, Suratsatana. The Lord, then, when he sees this sincere endeavor to serve his dear, the pure devotees, and to hear from them, he removes all the anartas, all the unwanted, um, unwanted dirt within our heart. There's coverings within our heart. The Lord removes it. So we can begin to see things for what they are, as they are, in relationship with Krishna. The symptoms of the sadhu is tolerant, merciful, friendly to all living entities. Because he sees everyone, pure devotee. He's everyone as Krishna's servant, part and parcel. Everyone. And although you may not act in that way, it seems from the external point of view sometimes, because we're in the material, we're dealing with the material world, trying to preach and so on and so forth. Discrimination is sometimes there, but the principle behind it is for the welfare of every living entity. Lord Chaitanya's movement particularly, absolutely, not just particularly, but it's absolutely for that purpose, is open to everyone. It's open to everyone, no matter what our condition is. The Sanctum movement of Lord Chaitanya is being made available to every living entity is universal movement for all creatures, all humans, everything, even the non-moving living entities. Every living entity is given the opportunity or has the opportunity to, um, to whatever extent it may be, but to come in contact with this Sankatan movement of Lord Chaitanya is all merciful or, what can we say, unconditional distribution of Krishna consciousness in one sense. The devotees go out chanting everywhere, just doing prasadam as much as they can, and etc. Et it's Because it's up to the individual whether they take it or not. But the offer is given to everyone. It's free to all. The devotee makes it available to everyone. The next verse. Mayanyena bhavena bhaktim kavanti hedridam matkite chapta karamanas such a sadhu engages in staunch devotional service to the Lord without deviation. For the sake of the Lord, he renounces all other connections, such as family relationships and friendly acquaintances within the world. Doesn't just do it, he's fed up with it. He does it for the sake of the Lord. 
just like Lord Chaitanya Mahaprabhu, at a young age accepted sannyas for the sake of the world, become a servant of every living entity. Madashvaya katha mishta shrinvanti katayanti cha tapanti vividhas tapa naitan mad gatachetasaha Engaged constantly in chanting and hearing about me, the Supreme Personality of Godhead, the sadhus do not suffer from material miseries because they're always filled with thoughts of my pastimes and activities. As was mentioned briefly earlier on here specifically, because they're always absorbed in thoughts of Krishna's pastimes. As that verse go in the Bhagavad Gita in the tenth chapter, um, I thought some my period of was always dwell in me, her lives have surrendered to me, and always deriving great happiness and bliss, always conversing about me, huh? associating with each other and conversing. How does it go in the Sanskrit? Machita Magatapanam, Bodhiantak Prasram, Katiantas Chamanicha, Tushyanticha, Ramanicha. Is that the right one? I think so. Anyway, if it's not, never mind. <laughs> it sounds good. And the next verse. Taiti sarva sadvi sarva sangha vivajitaha sangha stesh patate partaya sangha dosha harahite O my mother, O virtuous lady, these are the qualities of great devotees who are free from all attachment. You must seek attachment to such holy men, for this counteracts the pernicious effects of material attachment. Very significant verse. What does pernicious mean? Pernicious. Anyone know what it means? Anybody? Yes? Vicious? Pardon? Vicious. Vicious? Vicious. Yeah, vicious could be used. Vicious. Pernicious. Almost similar word, isn't it? The very negative results of material existence. Vicious. Very detrimental results. And the counteracting medicine or the, the way to uh, become free of that is, this is what it is. It's given here clearly by Lord Kapiladev. We have to associate with such personalities. There's no other way. Even associating with devotees who are mixed, that's okay in one sense, but it's not going to completely free one. We have to associate with a totally pure devotees. But how that's done, that's a topic in itself, through hearing from them, following their guidelines. Of course, Sri Prabhupada gives the example of these great devotees. They do leave the boat behind when they go, in many cases in the form of their shishya, in the form of their vani instructions. We often need help to understand how to apply that also. But in principle, by hearing from them in the form of their books, in the form of their lectures and so on, um, this also is seen to be a tremendous association, but unfortunately sometimes we also let's say we don't see it properly, we misinterpret, we take things out of context, etc., etc. What to, how to apply that which is relevant to our particular situation. We usually need help for that. Krishna will give it if we're sincere. And the next verse, famous, perhaps the most famous verse, Satam Pasangam Mamavirya Sangvido Bhavanti Vidkarna Vasayana Kata Darjoshana I won't read it word for word, it's very nice. Translation. In the association of pure devotees, discussion of the pastimes and activities of the Supreme Personality of Godhead is very pleasing and satisfying to the ear and the heart. By cultivating such knowledge, one gradually becomes advanced on the path of liberation. And thereafter he is freed and his attraction becomes fixed 
Then real devotion and devotional service begin. Very parallel to the teachings of Sutta Goswami in the second chapter, very similar. Purport by Srila Prabhupada. The process of advancing in Krishna consciousness and devotional service is described here. The first point is that one must seek the association of persons who are Krishna conscious and who engage in devotional service. Without such association, one cannot make advancement. Simply by theoretical knowledge or study, one cannot make any appreciable advancement. One must give up the association of materialistic persons and seek the association of devotees, because without the association of devotees, one cannot understand the activities of the Lord. Generally, people are convinced of the impersonal feature of the absolute truth. Because they do not associate with devotees, they cannot understand that the absolute truth can be a person and have personal activities. This is a very difficult subject matter. And unless one has personal understanding of the absolute truth, there is no meaning to devotion. Service or devotion cannot be offered to anything impersonal. Service must be offered to a person. Non-devotees cannot appreciate Krishna consciousness by reading the Srimad Bhagavatam or any other Vedic literature wherein the activities of the Lord are described. They think that these activities are fictional, manufactured stories, because spiritual life is not explained to them in the proper mood. To understand the personal activities of the Lord, one has to seek the association of devotees. And by such association, when one contemplates and tries to understand the transcendental activities of the Lord, the path to liberation is open and he is freed. One whose firm faith in the Supreme Personality of Godhead becomes fixed and his attraction for association with the Lord and the devotees increases. Association with devotees means association with the Lord. The devotee who makes this association develops the consciousness for rendering service to the Lord and then being situated in the transcendental position of devotional service, it gradually becomes perfect. Thus, consciously engaged in devotional service, in the association of devotees, a person gains distaste for sense gratification, both in this world and the next, by constantly thinking about the activities of the Lord. This process of Krishna consciousness is the easiest process of mystic power when one is actually situated on that path of devotional service, he is able to control the mind. Srila Prabhupada Ki Jai. So maybe some questions are there? Or comments? favorite pictures of Lord Chaitanya. Maharaj, is, can it be a question in general? Or yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. yeah. There's no specifics. Um, you mentioned this morning about forgiveness, and uh, I just wondered in the Bhagavad Gita, Krishna says, of all means of suppressing lawlessness and punishment, so what place does punishment have? in the Vedic system. In the Vedic system? Of course, material nature itself is, is in one sense, dishing out that punishment to the living entity in the form of varieties of karmic reactions. To save the living entity from that, which nowadays is not much, let's say, application of the laws of dharma, the laws of Nate, manu and so on, in the way of um, proper justification or justice in this regards. 
persons who act against dharma, against the instructions of scripture, whether it's not performing one's duty according to Varnashram, um, etc. It's interesting in the Bhagavad Gita when Arjuna asks the question, what is it causes a man to act sinfully even if it's against his will? And Krishna says, Kama Eshakra, go to Eshakra to Guna Samarbhava. So, lust only Arjuna. So how to counter that? Well, Arjuna is asking the question based primarily that a person acting against his nature. He's not talking about sex, sexual perversions necessarily. The whole chapter is dedicated to performing one's duty according to one's nature. So that's what he's referring to. The tendency not to perform one's duty is considered a sin, considered sinful. The whole Vedic culture, the laws of manner, everything are directed. Now within that, of course, there are many other categories which are described as misbehavior in various ways. Um, whether it's directly a crime of some kind, murder or rape or whatever, different things, theft and so on. All these different types of activities there are blasphemy and so on and so forth. Are all varieties of detail within that framework. Um, and how they're dealt with, according to the situation one's in, in the various varnas and ashrams, it will be dealt with differently. But unless there's a structure in place, then it's almost impossible to really ascertain the proper execution of, let's say, punishment or justice for an individual. You don't punish a child, for instance, the same way that you would punish an adult. So the child, you know, steal something. You don't call the police, generally, so I don't think you do anyway. If your child goes into your fridge, or into your pocket even, and takes out your wallet, and, you know, doesn't know what it is, huh? Maybe you don't carry cash anymore, but, and, you know, takes the money and throws it in the fire. What are you going to do? Call the police? Or if they walk out the door with your wallet? No, it's a different situation, animals. Human beings also, the rules are applied slightly differently to different persons in different ashrams. Different. One has to know what is one's duty, what is expected. And when things are all muddled and jumbled up, it's really difficult. It's not, it's, it's different people who receive it differently, they don't understand. And, and it's a jumbled sale. But in principle, yes, there's two things. As we are hearing this morning, or we were hearing yesterday, I don't know when it was, of a simple example, we could give many, but because we were reading it one or two days ago, it was the story of Naratam Das Thakur. And when he, one of his leading uh, disciples, Ganga Narayan Chakravarti, heard terrible blasphemy of Narutam Das Thakur from caste Brahmanas. And he tried, you know, counteracted it, and then he walked away. They didn't care less about his counteraction, so he walked away. He went away, and he was feeling, in one sense, you know, naturally you feel very disturbed when you hear blasphemy of a pure devotee, or whatever it may be. It's only natural. But in his heart of hearts, he was thinking, these poor Brahmins, how can they be delivered? They're going to have to suffer for this in hell. But a pure devotee like Haridas Thakur or even Ganga Narayan Chakravarti, they're always thinking of the person. They may not be in a position to inflict, we could say, what would normally be called punishment. That may have to be the modes of nature or Krishna's hand working there. But if you happen to be a Kshatriya, if you happen to be in that situation, it's one's duty to, for protection and not just protection of the, of the society as such, but the person who's actually engaged in activities which are detrimental, adharmic activities. So it's their duty to, to do what is the proper, whatever that is, the proper way of punishing the person who's acted irreligiously. It's their duty. Um, to the Kshatriyas, others may not be, that may not be their duty, but it's the Kshatriyas' duty to do that to inflict that punishment on them, for the purpose of purifying that person, whatever their crime may be. So that rod of punishment is Krishna, is that rod of punishment, you could say. And he manifests that through the form of the 
manu shast, manu samita, and other scriptures, laws of manu, which give directions how to deal with different situations. But when the whole thing is upside down in the beginning, it's very difficult to ascertain how to deal with it. Very difficult. Even during the time of Krishna, Yudhisthira Maharaj was also expressing how sometimes it's very difficult to ascertain the application of dharmic principles in such a situation. Very difficult. The contradictions are there sometimes. But the principle is there to try to act for the benefit of everyone, at least a realized or elevated soul in a, point, in a position of a Kshatriya or a leader. And Brahmins are always thinking like that, although they may manifest it differently than that of a Kshatriya. The Kshatriya has to make sure that everyone's doing their duty. That's his first responsibility, according to their nature. And then to make sure within that, everyone's, no one's acting in a way which is detrimental to their or other people's spiritual progress, according to their position. So if, for instance, a Brahmin is caught smoking a cigarette, or if a Brahmin is caught you know, watching some pornography or something crazy, that's definitely not to be done. But if a should was doing that, then that's something else. You just try to encourage them to do good things. Don't necessarily expect them to stop doing those things. If a Kshatriya is having a drink now and again, that's not considered necessarily to be a big crime. For a Brahmin it is. Even 50 years ago, for instance, a woman in England, if a woman was still smoking a cigarette, it was looked down upon as disgusting. Disgusting. No, it's not. Times have changed. It was never expected. Women, the spirit souls in women's body would drink and smoke, but men would. Not saying that that's justifiable, but it's just an example. So different people have different situations and uh, some are considered to be innocent or they're under the protection of others or then held responsible for what has happened, etc, etc. So everything is meant ultimately a laws of nature, laws of manner, every law of God is meant for the ultimate benefit and even punishment, what we call punishment, is actually for one's benefit. It's not done just because you hate someone or you want to establish your position um, as being, you know, absolute or something, is done with a genuine concern, a genuine concern for the person who's being punished, whatever it's called. Uh, it's done with compassion for the benefit of those persons, just like with our uh, Ganga Narayan, he was thinking, like, and ultimately they got the mercy. Those Brahmins were also delivered by the grace of the pure devotee. Um, and that's how the way he thinks. He's always thinking of the welfare of the living entities. Please have mercy on them, you know, even though they're behaving in the way they're doing. But the Kshatriya has to punish accordingly. That's his duty. Mercy is like that. To release the living entities. Simple example, if someone murders and they don't, in the Bible, eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth, these things were in every scripture. But if we don't do it like that, we just put him into a hotel called, or whatever, prison or whatever it's called, um, for you know, free accommodation with whatever different facilities are there, and just stick him in there. We may think, oh, this is being kind, this is being humane, this is being compassionate, but it's not. It's being cruel, being very cruel. And that person then has to pay the price in his next lifetime. But for atheists, that's not a consideration. It's not a consideration. But for those who believe in the will of God, the law of God, and understanding we're not this body, then what is the punishment anyway? It's just another method of trying to free us from this bodily identification. That's a punishment, tapasya. The very word tapa means to be punished or to perform austerity. That's a form of punishment too. When one gets up in the morning, takes a bath, whatever it is, performs various regulated programs, withdraws oneself from various activities, engages in activities which may not be the normal activities for sense gratification, etc. Puts oneself, sacrifices one's time, surrenders one's time and one's energy, not just to do what we want, but what the Lord wants or his period of what he wants. That's a form of tapasya, that's a form of punishment too, but that's a voluntary one. 
which purifies the heart, not just of karmic reactions, but awakens our attraction or our connection with Krishna also. So everything ultimately is for that purpose. But the details of that, that's a very complex subject matter. Um, and really, only those who are on a very elevated transcendental platform can give an absolute perspective on that one. But in principle, yes, that must be there for the purification or the benefit of the offender. But it's done with concern for their welfare, not just to get rid of them or because we hate them or whatever it is. I don't know if that means anything or not. Yeah, I'm right. Hare Krishna. And of course to protect the citizens. I mean, if there's somebody who's a rapist, for instance, what are you going to do? Oh, we're so sorry to hear about it. You know, well, you know, we're going to put you on a course for one month, and if you go through the course, you're a free man. Again, they go and do the same damn thing. You know, it's, it, there are some strict, strict applications which we can't apply nowadays, obviously. obviously. But, uh, you know, you have to see, is it working or not? Um, is the so-called reformation. The purpose is also their reformation, not just punishment. To reform, but it's rare that the reformation is going on because there's no actual, it's not based exactly upon the law of God, based upon our sentiment or our material attachments. So it doesn't really serve much purpose, save and accept, you know, some small atonement of some kind. But change really takes place. The real essence is a transformation of the consciousness of the living entity. Anything else? Uh, you said that, uh, what you said that uh, attachment to a sadhu opened the doors of liberation. Okay, here they said that, yeah. But my question is, is that attachment enough, or do we also need to follow the instructions of the Sabbath in order to get the liberation? And I can think of some examples in, in Iskon that the Buddhists who were attached to Prabhupada, and they were very attached to Prabhupada, but not necessarily they were following the strictly the instruct his instruction. So that's my, my doubt whether well, there's two things here. Opening the door is one thing, entering in is another. <laughs> and what type of liberation is on the other side? The door is another. Where have you gone? You collapsed. Oh, okay. There's too much for you. Yeah. Yeah, it certainly opens the door. But whether you go inside or not is another thing. To go inside, you have to follow. It's not enough just to sit there and look. We were doing that already, and we chose to come to the material world. You know, it's not enough just to look. You have to enter in. You can't just look at the pot of honey. Even if the lid's open, spiritual master may open the lid, but, you know, it's not enough just to look at it. You've got to get in there. You've got to enter in. So he's given us the directions how to enter into that, that other world, that world beyond this one. If we don't follow his instructions, it's, it's okay, it's a start. You know, you're, you've got some attraction for it, or you made some effort, but you're not surrendering, you're still keeping your foot in the material world. So, you know, you're going to become completely, as the verse is saying, completely give up, detach from this material world and completely attach. So the real attachment to a sadhu is we accept their instruction as our life and soul. Which Sri Prabhupada based his movement practically upon this principle, isn't it? The verse of Vishnu Shakravarti Thakur, in purport rather to the Vyavasi Yatmi Kavuti Rekhya in the Bhagavad Gita verse. In his prayer report where he talks about the instructions, he doesn't say, my attachment to my spiritual master is all that matters exactly. He says, the instructions of my spiritual master are all that matter to me. They're my sadhya. They're my sadhya. They're all that matters to me. 
that his goal to completely dedicate himself to the instructions of his spiritual master. That's the process, that's the way, that's the means of entering into that uh, beyond the door, so to speak, when we make those instructions their life and soul. Even if we go to hell, he says, I don't care. Those instructions are my life and soul. So it's definitely not enough. This is definitely the beginning. You can't enter in if the door is closed. The door is open. The spiritual master opens the door. But then he calls us, come in, follow my instructions. No, I don't want to. I love you, but I don't want to follow your instructions. There's a famous example of that in Hawaii with some of Prabhupada's disciples. They said, Prabhupada, we want to follow you. We don't want to follow anyone else. We love you, Sri Prabhupada. And Prabhupada said, well, if I ask you to do this, which you don't want to do, will you do it? They said, no. Prabhupada smacked his fist. He said, see the hypocrisy. Mm-hmm. One side you say you'll do whatever I say. When I ask you to do something, you say you won't do it. It's some um, matter of our sur- As they surrender unto me, I reward them accordingly. How much surrender we are. Yeah, it's a process. It takes time to cross over that ocean of anartha. It takes time. But we have to at least be willing to realize that. Be willing to accept that we do have to... The problem is within our own heart, not everywhere else. We have a natural conditioning of looking elsewhere for the answer or for the blame or whatever it is. And the real, only real problem is within our own heart. There's nothing else. And Krishna points it out by placing us or play, arranging different circumstances which seem to be incompatible or horrendous sometimes. But behind that, you know, because some things, same thing with the punishment question. On the surface, it's like black do and don't, punish and reward. And it's all kinds of like relative stuff. But there's an internal absolute feature going on here too. To try to bring us to that point of becoming sick, not just of eating meat and sick sex and all this and that, but the very idea of seeing ourselves independent from Krishna, the very idea of seeing ourselves as any kind of purusha whatsoever, the very idea of self as a controller, as an enjoyer, as a proprietor, whatsoever. Krishna's hands working behind the scene and placing us in or let, allowing circumstances in such a way to try to help or give us the opportunity to wake up and take shelter of him. Instead of taking shelter of do's and don'ts and this is and that's, they're all good if they're properly done. They may help, but that's not the ultimate purpose behind them. The purpose behind it is to completely surrender to Krishna. Whatever you want, my Lord, you can break me, crush me, ignore me, whatever. But you're always my worshipful Lord. We have to take, if we don't take that path, it will not develop by just keeping our independent perspective. We're on the side of ignorance and we're seeing Krishna through ignorant eyes or judging the pure devotee through ignorant eyes. Uh, the heart has to become cleansed. And then we can see who, what we're really talking about when we say a pure devotee or the Supreme Lord or whatever it is, the spiritual realm. With a dirty heart, what can we see? We can't see anything. We can't see. The, we're seeing, but we're not really seeing. We're seeing something. And when we see the deity, is the deity seeing us, or we're seeing the deity? Who's seeing who? The deity is seeing you, or me, or anyone else. Seeing our heart. Where is our consciousness? We're seeing through our consciousness. So we're judging things according to our consciousness, not necessarily according to what actually is going on. We have, every one of us has this tendency, any conditioned soul has this tendency to see things through our conditional state. So to transform that conditional state, we, 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 the path is given here is to follow the guideline, the path given by the Mahajans, the great devotees of the Lord. That will gradually cleanse our consciousness or our means of perception so that we're slowly things will become clarified. Things will become clearer and we can see how Krishna's hand is working. Otherwise, we, we tend to think the way I see it is correct. It's the nature of this world. Mm. Chastisement's meant to help 
adjust that. Particularly the association of pure devotees helps to point this out. So we may still be working, even though we've been around a few decades, we may still be working with the false seagull being somewhat influential in our dealings, in our way we do things and so on. It's painful, but it takes a little time. Hare Krishna, anything else? I don't sure, bro. Well, if you were mentioning in the class that we should chant the holy name carefully, and uh, that ver- the verse text out in Shah Krishna Namachari Nadi Sitapi Vidya, uh, Shri Ramaj is breaking it down that uh, the jaundiced state where it's sour is uh, when you're chanting Namaharad, and then the stage of um, chanting carefully comes when you're Nishka, when you're Majima Adhikari. So does that mean um, you can only really aspire? Yeah, we're trying to come at least to that platform. And on that platform, we're trying to come to the ecstatic platform, you could say. The goal of our sadhana is, it's, well, maybe we'll talk about Krishna Prema, but we, by that alone, we can't even come to Baba Bhakti. But we aspire for that. To become attached, firmly attached to the Lord, to his devotees, the holy dham, to the holy name, firmly fixed and attached in that sense. Yeah, everyone has to, we can't, you know, as an akanishta or an offensive mentality, what is the question of love of God? I mean, it's a question, but what is the question of experiencing it? Um, the purification has to be there. It has to at least come to the mudjim platform, at least. We were making that. We recognize the need. We're doing the needful and uh, applying it in our lives. It's so important. Movement, if it remains always on the platform of canister dealings, is never going to get off the ground practically. You see, everyone's going to be like an enormous movement, a grounded situation. Grounded, I don't mean in terms of spiritual solidity, but in terms of still attached to the, what I think I am, what I think should be done, etc., etc. Who cares a damn ultimately what we think should be done? We do, and maybe a few others do, but ultimately is what Krishna wants. And the mechanista can't see that. And if he doesn't follow at least a madhyam or an uttama, of course, ideally, but at least a madhyam, he's never going to get out of that. Oh, I got word there. I thought there was a sudden revo- revolution there, revolution or revelation coming out. You're wrong. You got it wrong. Great. I'm happy. Thank you. I'd be very happy. I don't know. You know, Shiva and Maj is so much more advanced and <coughs> serious about the need to advance in Krishna consciousness and not just to keep the status quo, so to speak, and live in our comfort zones, but to actually advance. That's the whole purpose of this movement. It's not just to make a movement of neophytes. Uh, we just heard there that the essence is to associate with advanced devotees. The essential prophet wanted that in this movement. He wanted to create an association. It's because when we hear from advanced devotees, then it has a profound effect, even the public. When the chanting is that of advanced devotees, it has such a much more penetrating effect on those. Who, whether they, how much they hear is another thing, but whatever they do hear has an effect, much more powerful. Well, Prabhupada wanted that. He said many times he wants his devotees to become pure, a pure association of pure devotees. <laughs> how do you define that, believe that? And people would find it very simply and some little bit more sit more deeply. But pure devotees who have don't have an interest in their own agendas, they don't have an interest in their own perspectives, perceptions, or they don't have an interest in sense gratification or being recognized as a pure devotee or anything. They're not like that. They're attached to devotional service and nothing can disturb them. Even everyone else says they're wrong. They're not disturbed. They're fixed. Fixed. And 
something, they realized. They can impart that knowledge because they realize the truth. At least they realized the higher the path we have to go on to reach that truth. Well, Madhya Madhikari at least must be there. But we're fixed, no matter what the challenges are. But, uh, and of course, you don't go from one to the other overnight. It's not like you're either one or the other, you're mixed. But we want to come to that platform and go beyond it, of course. Yeah. So when chanting in that platform, then there's a inti- the degree, the intensity, the, the, the necessity, the lolium, whatever it's described as, will start to, say, intensify. All the sick of distra- disturbance in one's execution of service, or wasting time, or whatever it may be, which is you know, not really favorable. Mm-hmm of dealing with the world you can't avoid to a certain extent. And having to deal with numerous situations of mundane or very mixed situations. But still, one always, that, that this increases one's determination for pure devotional service to take shelter of Krishna completely. And slowly propelling us forward in our devotional service. Madhya Madhikari, in real sense, is at least at a stage of, of nishta, at least, in reality. And maybe, of course, Madhya tendencies all along, up to through the Bhajan period, maybe, they're also following a Madhya Madhikari, and to some extent we're attached to various aspects of that. Firmly fixed when there's nishta. There's no interest in that of the I mean, you preach to them and help and so on your compassion, not interested in that which is, you know, most people in this world are interested in. What do you think? Add to it, let's go further. You obviously heard from Shiva much. Speak. Yeah. No, the common main by women in this room is that in Iskan, most of the don't get up the other side of it. A lot in the Vritti, so they spend their entire life trying to get to the stage of Nishka. And they don't, they don't push through to, to that stage where they're carefully chanting. So it seems like, oh, I'm just going to go and carefully chant. It's actually quite elusive. They just want to go and carefully chant? Yeah, they, it seems it would be very easy to do, but actually to do it is very elusive. It's very difficult. Yeah. So how to transform, how to, trans, how to go from that stage? What, what are you going to do? I mean, you can't just mechanically apply it by chanting 64 rounds and think you're going to become Nishtabhakta. I mean, the stage is there, of course, of Nishtabhajana Kriya. We follow the spiritual master's instructions. Is that enough? I mean, in terms of the basic instructions, is it enough? Don't be shy to say what you are. On your I don't even know if it's enough for Vaikuntha, but let's say it is. Mm-hmm. Okay. But then to be spontaneous, then it has to go beyond just. Well, what, how, what does that mean? I mean, practically speaking, do we just put it in the back burner for now, or is it something that's supposed to be in the pot also at the moment, or not? was saying you have to be aware of the satya and apply that in the sadhana so you have to know which direction you're going in. So even if you know the stage right now it's spontaneous. You have to know which direction you're aiming at, isn't it? Your goal, your objective goal. Is that enough? Say, uh, what does it mean to know what my goal is? Say say we're looking at stages here. Say our goal is Raganuga Bhakti. Raganuga means spontaneous, right? Spontaneous. Spontaneously attracted to devotion. And that will, of course, go to the object of one's devotion. Spontaneously attracted. Um, so, is there anything else we can do except for practice Vaidhi Bhakti with the knowledge that our aim or our goal mm-hmm. is to reach higher stages beyond an art and and Raganuga is the purpose. I mean, Lord Chaitanya didn't come to teach Vaidhi Bhakti. Well, 
Although it was part of the teachings, of course, but that wasn't his objective goal, by any means. To, to meditate upon the Vrajvasi that you model yourself on, that you're aspiring? Is that not a little bit premature for one who's still trying to chant 16 rounds? So is that all there is for those who are on, on that platform? But one expects after some time there would be some, some <laughs> advancement <laughs> beyond you know, the battlefield of near, near, near fight. Near fight means near a fight. <laughs> There's always this frictional battle going on within and without. And they fight. One is Madhyam is they may have a fight in order to try to you could say how to present Krishna consciousness, but there's no fight inside the section, there's no fight with any one particularly. Just the struggle to how to present the message or how to become completely attached to Krishna and just you spit at the sword of sense gratification like that. But um is there anything else we can do? I mean, that's probably no doubt the case, but that's usually one who's on the platform of Nishta, I mean, at least of Nishta. You don't usually imitate that in neophyte stage. That can be very dangerous. It can be offensive, in fact. Anything else on that? Uh, there's a book by Sri Ramaj Sankapa Kamudi, which is more, it's more about finding out where you are and understanding what is the next step that you need to take. So he says the onus is on everybody that's practicing to find out what the next step is. Mm, that's interesting, isn't it? What is it? Where we're situated in devotion. How are you going to find that out? I'm very advanced, you know, because I'm, I've been around a long time and I've chanted, I counted the other day, I can't chanted 14,583,321,511 names of Krishna. And I've eaten 5,000 tons of prasadam <laughs> and have distributed one million books and you know, I've had every position you can think of in ISKCON and now I'm a pure devotee. How do you ascertain it? Honestly introspective, interesting. Sometimes we need a little help to realize that, don't we? I guess it's something which will naturally evolve in time. Being open, being open, enthusiastic to be, you know, corrected or whatever you want to call it. And chastised sometimes, the word may be used. But at least being corrected, that maybe I'm not right. Perhaps I'm not right. Perhaps I've got something wrong here. That's one thing, I suppose. The openness, the willingness, the desire. Not that we become naive and, you know, you go to a, a, a kind of, you know, whatever, nonsense person and ask them for direction. But the in internal intention of recognition within our hearts that we do need change. I guess that's how we came to this movement in the first place. In many cases, we were hankering for something. I'm God, okay, God, I need something, I need some help, I need some guidance or something. I get a little familiar after a while, get stuck in ruts. So that little recognition, we need to go forward. This is a movement, it's not meant to stagnate. And neither are we meant to stagnate. We're meant to be going forward, so. That recognition of the need is there in Krishna. You could say that's how we reciprocate, isn't it? Anything else? And recognition of our goal, recognition of where we're at, or at least desiring to know. And you see, actually, if you read um, in um, um, Vilapakushamanji, is that what it's called? Vilapakushamanji? You see that there, but you see it very clearly if you read, say, for instance, it's not our business to expect everyone to read these things, but it is there. In other scriptures of Bhakti Vinodha, called like Jaiva Dharma or Chaitanya Sikshamrit, how you see again and again. Can you tell me what level I'm on? What should be my, you know, sadhana? What should, you know, that's at all stages, what is relevant? And the general application of, of devotional service, which is, 
I guess you could say general principles you would receive because Swami has given in that nectar of devotion applicable to all in different degrees, according to the spiritual master may give different degrees. To, Bhakti Siddhanta Maharaj gave different number of rounds, for instance, to different disciples. He wasn't 64 for everyone. Some people he gave four. Some he just said, just chant. He never even gave a number. Just chant. Others he gave 64. According to the situation, we can't imitate that, but a period of you may be able to see that. Different stages people are on. And by association with those, I mean, the key really is to know how to associate, to ascertain those who are more advanced and how to associate with them. In one sense, that's, I would say that's the real key, is association. Of course, we have to have a desire. Everything's based on desire. Do we really want to advance? If we do, then we should find out what it means to advance, what it entails. If you want a job, you better find out what it means before you take accept the job. Don't get you no. Know, don't start blaming someone afterwards. You should find out before. If you want to go and live in a place, you should. If you want to marry somebody, all these things you should find out before. You know what this entails, isn't it? You can't really blame them afterwards. You should have found out that before. So similarly, we should find out. And what it means, what is a pure devotee, what association and so on. We hear today qualities of a pure devotee. It says on a higher platform perhaps than what we're used to, but it's definitely that should be there, it should be taken into consideration. And, uh, and what it means to associate. It's not just hanging around and trying to get some favors and you know, hoping that they'll fulfill my material desires, satisfy my problems of family life and money and this and that. Not really the point. How I can become freed of all these, you know, whatever an artist I have. And Krishna will give. Give that association. We have to be willing to take it. The desire of the individual. And then if we have that, sincere desire, Krishna will give us, arrange step by step, the opportunities to progress and beat out those attachments which we have or those illusions about ourselves, our false ego and so on and so forth. What do you think? It's important, isn't it? I mean, in, the, in our lives, one of the reasons to is step outside of the institution of ISKCON so-called, is one of them. I'm not saying it's the prime one or whatever you want to call it, I'm just saying one, is, uh, is that you know, they have failed either to find or understand or something or another and they're looking for answers, they're looking for association or something. That's the positive side. There are many negative reasons as well. But it's a positive one you could say. And the Prabhupada wanted that. He wanted that we have, that we advance him. I mean, he didn't spend his blood and sweat so that we just create, you know, millions of neophytes everywhere. We want to please Krishna, and that means pure devotion. You can't rubber stamp somebody a pure devotee. It doesn't work. <laughs> Rules and regulations are needed, essentially needed. But they're for a purpose, they're not the goal in themselves. They're for a purpose. Without a doubt, it's, it's a challenge, and it's going to be always a challenge. We're dealing with the material work in Kali Yuga, age of quarrel and hypocrisy. Many devotees, like you know, with the Ritviks, for instance, you know, they may have some in sincere intent or whatever you want to call it, attachment to Prabhupada, but you know, there's more to just being attached to Prabhupada than just leaving it now. Probably one need to advance in Krishna consciousness, not stay a neophyte forever. <laughs> nobody could, because I'm not advanced, nobody can advance, pull them down. It's not really the process of our charges, they want us to advance. What to say? Nice to speak the theory, the practice is uh, another thing. Definitely, you need that. Anything else? Yes, who's that, Ashish? What's your name? 
Ananda? Ananda Lila? Vigra. Ananda Vigra. Yes. Okay. Maharaj, the number of years in Krishna consciousness be a steady parameter, be a parameter to ascertain what level one is in? If you're in Krishna consciousness, maybe. Number of years being around may or may not be. It, uh, respect may be paid for those from the practical social point of view you could say no doubt and there should be some indication and we were hearing the other day Bhakti Siddhanta Maharaj who normally for instance is known not to delve into higher realms of subject matters he was he wouldn't even let many of his disciples read for instance the uh, third chapters 30 to 35 of the Bhagavatam in the 10th county so you can't read it you can read the rest, but not that. Many of his disciples, he wouldn't let them read it. He gave them, you know, which ones to read, even practically, according to their adhikar, their eligibility. But when he was one, one year, I don't know which year, 30, something or another, on Parikrama in Vrindavan, you know, we hear all about him going to Radhakun and speaking on the Upanishads and this and that. But one year he went there, and you probably know this, he said, we shall now talk upon, you know what he said? Asta Kaliya Lila. Topics of, you know, persons normally who are on a slightly higher platform of devotional, devotional service, you know, at least in a stage of Raganuga. Said, now we will speak on it, although it's not normal. And many of you are with us today who are not, not, being, not familiar with this, but you must know about it. And many of you have been chanting for 10 to 15 years, you should be ready to hear this. <laughs> 10 to 15 years, you know, maybe they've been chanting, the ones who are chanting 64 rounds a day, I don't know. And then what type of chanting is another thing, but he said, at least many of you should be, you should be ready to hear this. And he spoke on it, even though many were neophytes and so on. So one knows what is the, you know, this is, it's not just a subject which is forevermore like a, you know, a myth with sagism, deviation bogus, you know, whatever different reactions one may get. It's certainly not something for neophytes. But uh, he made it clear that you should be advancing, that's the point. And that it shouldn't be something you ram down people's throats, but you should know that this is, we are meant to advance to this stage, but it's not an artificial thing. It's interesting, it comes from within, and the internal um, awakening is confirmed and the different paths are there, but it's confirmed by the pure devotees of the Lord. It's not that you know, they necessarily impose it upon you, it comes from within by practicing, following in the footsteps of the pure devotees of the Lord. Then that natural affection or attraction, inclination may come, and that's confirmed by the pure devotees of the Lord. Then, of course, there may be a slightly different approach, different type of meditation, whatever it may take place. But that's not for neophytes, that's for advanced, more advanced stage. These topics. Yes, Yes. <clears throat> Our. So, yeah, thank you, Maharaj. And if we're wanting to progress... And if we want to? Want to progress, you know, in our devotional service. Progress, yeah. And you know, do we need to be active within ourselves and enforce it, or are we to accept the situations that come around us as being Krishna's arrangement and just go along with whatever's happening around us, or should we be actively trying to make things happen? Like one of these wonderful, or, you know, okay, I know what you call it. It's sometimes a conflict within our hearts. Do we just depend, carry on and just depend upon the center of mercy? which ultimately is what is the cause, is the mercy of the Lord, or do we have to do something else, actively try to, you know, do something else, whatever that may be, or aspire in different ways? It's a very good question. Very good question. Um, so what do we do in those situations? Um, and we could answer that in one sense, both. Both. We shouldn't just be lazy. At the same time, we shouldn't expect an honorary degree. 
we have, as Krishna says to Arjuna, you know, perform your duty and be conscious of me. He didn't just say do your duty or just be conscious of me, both. So yes, we do, we follow and we try to understand what that means and you know, try to tolerate whatever that means, circumstances which we don't understand, but we don't give up our service. We may sometimes, sometimes things may have to be adjusted, but in principle we don't give up our service. And we pray and take shelter of Krishna. We pray for his mercy to advance so we can actually please him or just rise above these anartas, rise above this cloud of ignorance. Pray for that. And try to hear, hear from the right source. Try not to become too much, let's say, expose oneself to negativities which are unfavorable to your progress in spiritual life. And try to hear that which is favorable and pray for you know, the Lord's guidance and mercy. And at the same time, we don't just do that. We think just sit down and hear and chant all day long. Generally, the world is not advanced for that. It's not appropriate. It doesn't depend on that entirely. It depends on the mercy of the spiritual master and Krishna, our advancement. So one finds out how to get that mercy. What would Prabhupada want me to do? What would my spiritual master want me to do? If he's actually a bona fide spiritual master, what would Prabhupada want me to do? This type of attitude is probably quite favorable. Even if you don't know what to do, you do pray, please, Prabhupada, I just want to do what you want me to do, what should be done. Um, and just the mood itself is favorable. And whatever else happens to our purification order, so be it, but we at least aspire like that. We don't just do that, but we do what we know, um, what is our position we're in to do, and we aspire to become more pure in that sense, through prayer, through association, through... Basically, if we follow what Prabhupada wants us to do, or what he's given us to do at this stage, that's quite a lot. I mean, what did he want us to do? Keep engaged 24 hours a day, for instance, is a regular instruction Prabhupada gave. What type of engagement? That means different things, different devotees, different natures, but some or another to keep fully engaged in devotional service. Washing, cleaning, ninefold process of devotional service. Which, uh, we have to be, realize that that's the, the, the process right now. What, what happens then when we naturally become inclined in due course of time, carefully avoiding the offenses in devotional service, least to Vaishnavas especially. Try not to offend Vaishnavas. And, uh, and try to, we try our best to chant and hear in the association of devotees and hear Bhagavatam and st- at least two hours a day hearing Shastra for those who are seriously able to practice the sadhana. And chant all the time, wherever you can chant, even if it's not on your beads, just keep trying to chant. And what else can we do? So both are there, but we have to have a desire to advance. We must want to advance, not stay where we are, stuck in a rut. Stuck in a rut, you may get real, may get some respect from those around you who are similarly minded. You may achieve things from the external point of view. Lots of books distributed. Nothing wrong with that. That's great. Opening many temples, many followers. But Lord Chaitanya didn't seem to make that a priority. A Dhanana Janana syndrome. I don't want these things, I want pure devotion. But still, to come to that platform, these stages, like a child growing up, needs that. We need that too also, but at some point of time, we, one uh, you know, would hope that one's heart isn't totally depending on that, for judgment of your matureness in devotional service. I don't know if that makes any sense. But I would say both. Both. Anything else? One more. Uh, 
Niyama Agraha. Niyama Agraha. Yeah. It says that one of the translations of that is to be impertinent or to be reticent, to go beyond your station, or to be, uh, like you're saying, being lazy and not really yeah. just staying in a comfort zone where you you manage to maintain a certain level. Yeah, yeah. You're not going to go forward, so you just yeah. sort of see Well, you're getting what you want, you know, your conditional desires are being fulfilled egotistical desires or whatever you want to call it and people around you are praising you perhaps and you know you're in one sense as you say a comfort so we were listening to an interesting lecture about a month ago with one very learned devotee from India and uh, the discussion was the past time it was Balaram's appearance day so we were discussing Dana Kasura's Lord, Lord Balaram killing Dana Kasura you probably heard that past time over and over again but he was kind of like approaching it in different ways. And one of the ways was this tendency to, as Dana Kasura, what was one of his external tenancies? I don't mean his, what he represents, but literally what was one of his tenancy? What did he do? Kicking. Huh? He was fond of kicking people. Kicking? Maybe he's fond of kicking people. He was an ass. He was in the form of an ass. So, but basically speaking, he was living in a forest, wasn't it, with his cohorts? What was the forest called? Taliban. Taliban, okay. Taliban forest, a type of fruit called tal, tal fruit. So he was in that forest. And now, did he eat the tal? He didn't eat the tal. He didn't eat it. Did he let anyone else eat it? No. Even if they wanted to. He was a miser. Well, he didn't even have it, really. It was meant for Kamsa. But he wouldn't let anyone come in there. Sometimes you hear it was actually for Kamsa. It was one of his demoniac ministers. But principally, he wouldn't let others have it, even though he wouldn't eat it himself aside from the historical side, the actual practical lesson. There's a tendency there. Yeah. Stopping people to advance in Krishna consciousness. Blocking their advancement. Mm, well, well, maybe we can't recognize it because we're not advanced ourselves. So it's a delicate question, but it's a quite delicate topic. But that's the principle. To, because that, if you do, then you have to advance too. It means you've got to get off your ass and start surrendering. <laughs> yeah. Otherwise you're going to be made, made to look a bit of a dirt, a bit of a fool. Which is good to have that in its spur, but we shouldn't block anyone. It's sour grapes, huh? Sour grape philosophy. If you can't taste it, then nobody can. And that's Dana Kasura. This is a part of Nima Agraha whatever it is, not wanting to advance in Krishna consciousness. So the desire to advance is essential. Whatever level we're on, you may not think about it in the beginning, it's not necessarily a topic which you're going to think about every day necessarily. You're advancing automatically by adopting so many wonderful new devotional activities and practices and this is exciting and reading new things. And after a while you've got to that introvert, you've got to introspect a little bit and see what next, where we or, you know, go a little deeper or whatever you want to call it. Yeah. Don't be lazy. Laziness, and in fact, even though I described that as a big sin, a sin to be lazy. Yeah. It's our real responsibility, our real dharma is to is to serve you know, pure devotional service, to advance towards pure devotion. It's not just to perform activities according to our nature. That's the materials, the dharma, constitution, conditional, the conditional dharma. The constitution of dharma is another thing. We have to work towards that. Hare Krishna. Okay, thank you all very much. Shri Prabhupada Ki Jai. Shri Mangrantraya